Well, good afternoon, everybody. I think we'll get started. Uh, welcome to the fifth national learning event. We're on five already. Wow, where, where's that time gone? And uh, absolutely delighted to welcome our two guests today to the to share their thoughts. Before we get started, just to let you know we are recording this session, so it will be available afterwards, and we'll post it on YouTube and our futures platform as well. Uh, Lucy, my colleague, is keeping on the chat. So if you want to post any comments or questions in the chat, we'll pick those up later on. What we'll do, we'll we'll hear from Rachel and then we'll hear from Brian uh, and then we'll take questions uh, from the floor afterwards. So either post them in the chat or pop your hands up at the end. Uh, that would be fantastic. So two really great colleagues joining us today. Really pleased uh, that Rachel and Brian can, can join us. We're going to hear from Rachel first, who's going to kick us off and tell us about the work at Walton and Holton, Warrington and Holton Hospitals and the Active Hospitals Programme, which I picked up on through Twitter. And it was just a, a fantastic example of how an organisation is taking hold of some of the reconditioning games or reconditioning as a, as a principle uh, and driving it across the whole organisation. We often hear about really passionate individuals who are um, uh, ploughing their own furrow, which is great, and then working in particular wards or their own care homes or whatever. So it was great to see the work that um, Rachel and her teams and, and others with great support from senior leaders at uh, Warrington and Halton are doing. Um, so after we've heard from Rachel, uh, we're obviously going to hear from a man who needs no introduction, but I will anyway. Uh, almost, you know, where, where it all goes back to in terms of the work that we're doing and why we're here today. Uh, the, the work of uh, Brian and um, raising awareness of deconditioning through the MPJ paralysis work and more recently through the last thousand days about uh, really promoting the message of patient patients time is the most valuable currency in healthcare and I think that all relates to what we're talking about in terms of patient care and those delays that that, that occur for people uh, so we're, we're very much here we, we heard from Geraldine and Debbie from the east of England last week last session um, and this and the history of this work all goes back through back through them and back through to Brian as well. So we definitely wouldn't be here today without all the work that Brian has done. And I, and I know that he'll be incredibly humble uh, and deflect that uh, incredibly well. But um, uh, we, we, we're we very grateful for all the work that you've done over the years, Brian. So uh, and we really appreciate you joining us here today. Uh, so I'm going to kick us off with uh, Rachel. I'm going to hand over to you. I think you're going to share your slides and talk you through the work at Warrington and Halton. I will. Thanks very much, Nick. Um, so just going to switch to share my screen. And hopefully you can see that. Lovely. So hello, my name is Rachel um, and I'm here today from Warrington and Holton NHS Trust because I believe that deconditioning is the biggest unseen patient harm and for which we've all got to take responsibility for. Meaningful activity, whether it's physical, whether it's mental, whether it's social, it's fundamental to the health and well-being of those we look after. And we should all embed this culture within our own organisations. So here we are. This is where we are, Warrington and Halton, for those who aren't sure. So we're a busy acute trust. We're sandwiched nicely within the nine boroughs of Cheshire and Merseyside. We border Wigan, Salford and Trafford and we serve approximately 340,000 residents. I, however, come from the southwest of the country and I still very much get strange looks from my Warringtonian patients. They're trying to place my accent. They try every day, but not, not one has guessed yet where I'm from. So my background is in physiotherapy. I'm a frontline specialist clinician and I did take the scenic route into the profession. So I dabbled a bit in research, in nursing support, um, in science education and a variety of other things but that's that's another story for another time. So I've been asked to come here today to talk about the Warrington and Holton Active Hospitals Programme. So this is a whole organisation approach to embedding activity into everyday clinical care. So it all started with this with Brian, there he is, telling us to end PJ paralysis of course and as did many teams across the country, across the world, we donned our PJs and we raised awareness of this vital campaign when it was launched. Now, unfortunately, the NHS uniform policy said that we could not all wear our PJs to work every day. And even though we had the vision, we had the why, 
we had we didn't have the strategy and we didn't have the tactics in place to adopt this into our everyday care. So it was clear we needed to change our culture around physical activity and to shift the spotlight onto deconditioning as a harm. So Brian in his talk later, hopefully, will allude to cultural change being about hearts and heads and hands. And I hope to explain here how we are trying to adopt that approach through the WHH Active Hospitals programme. So I started with a stakeholder analysis who was going to be part of the team in the widest sense. And I mean widest in that it didn't matter who you were, what team you're in, what you crave, what your role, who your manager was, it didn't matter. And of course, at the heart of this was our lovely patients and our families. They're the vital stakeholder. So we focus firstly on patients that were admitted through our A&E to our inpatient wards, as this was a really vulnerable group and at high risk of hospital associated deconditioning. Now, a strategy would mean nothing without getting the view of our number one stakeholder. And here is one of our patients, Beverly, and she's expertly representing. And this is what she has to say. So apologies, just a, a little bit about the sound quality. This was filmed on a busy acute ward and it represents the reality of really trying to capture what our patients think. So hopefully you can hear it OK. It's very important to stay active in hospital because if you sit in bed all day, all your joints dry up and you can't walk and you can't move and you, you have to wait for everybody. Whereas if, if you can walk, you could put your own shoes on and sit to near this toilet without having to wait for the staff to come and say I think it's important that you get in and out of bed. You would if you was at home. So where's your difference? So I hope you heard Beverly OK, and that I think you'll agree she pretty much nailed what this is all about. So to form a strategy, I did some baseline data collection. So I thought it was important to prove what was happening locally to make it more real. Plus, with any large scale change, it's vital to analyse the problem, not just jump in with a solution. So these charts show the discharge outcome of 50 medical patients, and they were discharged from the trust between November 21 and March 22. And the first chart on the left here shows that there's a strong trend between delays in getting patients up and out of bed and an increased length of stay. This means that the longer the patients remained in the bed before getting up as they normally would, they stayed in hospital, the longer they were staying in the hospital. And in the second chart, I looked at how many days a patient was on bed rest without a medical reason from admission and then their functional dependence on discharge or how much help with a day to day they needed compared to before. So you can see here that patients that mobilised on the first day or day zero had no ch change in their dependence. The numbers go up and down a bit. You know, this isn't a research study and the demographics are large. But when it, what is clear is when you get to about five days, um, a delay in mobilisation and is, is clear and then your function starts to deteriorate quite rapidly. I remember looking after one particular 75 year old that was using a bedpan um, unnecessarily. She didn't get up for 12 days. Um, I came to see her on a Saturday and fair to say she was absolutely fuming about it. There was no medical reason for her to be there on the beds and she needed care and mobility equipment on discharge rather than just going home to look after herself and look after a cat as she did normally. So from all of this, I developed a project plan and obtained sponsorship from our chief nurse um, and deputy CEO, Kimberly, and our lead AHP head of therapies, Michelle, which was absolutely key. As part of the background and scoping work, we looked at what had been done with the Moving Medicine Active Hospitals pilot down in Oxford and decided to adapt this approach using change modelling, using QI methodology and with project planning support. So the aim from the start was for deconditioning awareness and prevention to be part of our culture. Um, and it was seen as fundamental to patient safety. We have an amazing patient safety nursing team at Warrington, and it was clear that the deconditioning needed to be part of their work. So part of looking at falls, looking at pressure ulcers. It was an unseen harm and it was the missing piece of the puzzle. So patient stories were and they still are fundamental to this work. And the challenge then was wrapping around that strategy and building a team of enablers to facilitate the change. So for any plan to be effective, it's useful to know, it's useful to understand, and it's useful to plan for the barriers to change from the start. 
Uh, policies aren't likely to be successful if only one of the barriers is looked at and addressed. And then even if the change seems beneficial, so the evidence for, for PJ paralysis, you know, it's undisputable, people and organisations might still stick to existing behaviour, particularly if it's habitual, and then this habitual behaviour takes longer to change. So we were finding that the, the main barriers were fear of patients falling over, um, an unclear message about activity in general in an acute setting, staffing level, staffing time, and lack of awareness and consensus that deconditioning was indeed a harm. And this was both from our staff and from our patients. So going back a bit to my science roots, there's something called emission bias, which I think goes a way to explain some of this. So this is the human tendency to fear making a mistake through action. So getting up or getting a patient up and they fall over rather than being fearful of making mistakes through inaction. So do nothing. Patients are safer. I'm safer in the bed. So then these biases are often subconscious, which adds to the challenge we have here. <clears throat> so aside from all the planning and strategizing to create active hospitals, I had to come up with a concept, uh, one that was easily digestible for both our staff and our patients. And it was to form the framework of what active hospitals was all about to explain how to do it. So the Ready, Dress, Go concept came about, and this was from working with some of our patients in our cardiology ward. And they were taking part in what was called Morning Movers, which was an exercise class developed with our amazing cardiologist, Dr. Ahmed Farag. Um, he did a lot of work with us with therapies pre-COVID to get our very acute patients exercising safely on the ward. And the premise was simple. So it was Ready, Dress, Go. So Ready was giving our patients and families and our staff information about deconditioning, involving them right from the start in the recovery. The dress was to train staff to promote normal daily activity, such as getting up and dressed. Didn't matter what they were getting dressed in. It was about the actual activity of adopting that normal day to day routine. And this is for recovery on, on an acute ward. And then the go was for all staff to enable patients to participate in activity. Again, it doesn't matter what the activity was, whether it was safe for mobility, whether it was exercise, whether it was an activity of, of um, sort of cognitive side, it was essential part of the routine clinical care. So this is what we did. So we developed a series of patient and staff info resources, a patient info leaflet. We branded it, we promoted it, and we provided a clear message that Warrington and Holton are active hospitals. So this is just a selection of what's on display. And in the middle here is an exercise um, certificate that we give out to patients that participate in our exercise. And on the back there is some other useful websites that patients can use when they go home to remain active. So again, just promoting that wider public health message. We joined the recon games, obviously, and then the timing was ideal uh, as it was a really great incentive for getting more and more teams to get involved. Um, everyone, I think, loves a bit of healthy competition in the NHS, and we decided to um, standardise our outcome measure. So the number of patients that were up in time for lunch and this really reinforced that organisational approach. So here's the poster that was designed with our staff as feasible and easy to collect. And I think it's done the rounds on WhatsApp and I think it's on the, the Futures platform. So I hope other teams have found it useful. So what we did is we simply WhatsApped a picture of this completed to our QI team on a weekly basis for data collection. And I think it's important to stress again here the collaborative approach. So measures, they were designed by the people collecting the data and by the people analysing the data. So it needed to be feasible, otherwise it wouldn't just it just wouldn't be done. So then we uh, embedded active hospitals into mandatory clinical training. And this again was through working with the clinical education team to incorporate it within existing falls and moving and handling training. We thought that was the most efficient way to do it. It's been included in the multi-professional perceptionship programme in Student Voice and will be on the junior doctor training curriculum from May. So collectively we've trained hundreds of staff. We've also made a five minute video with our chief nurse for staff to access at their leisure and developed a bespoke training programme with our external training provider Later Life to upskill and develop our clinical support workers to champion active hospitals. 
So here are just a few more examples of the staff and public facing website we developed and just a little tweet down there on the left hand side. That's from the patient safety team and it's about the trust clothing bank and the relations with deconditioning, which again just demonstrates the breadth of the interdepartmental team working going on. So to deliver the go, as I mentioned, we've developed a completely bespoke um, training day which targets our highly valued clinical support workers. We're going to train and upskill our HCAs to support activity and exercise on the ward, to increase the message and reach about remaining physically active as being vital. And this is following a successful training pilot for our therapy support workers. We're also looking at the bigger picture in terms of mobility plans and equipment provision to ensure that when patients, when they're ready to get up and go, they've got the means and they've got the safety advice ready to go. It's about shifting that culture again for mobility is kind of, you know, walk around. It's a nice thing to do if you get a chance, but no worries if not. But no, actually, maintaining mobility is vital for the safety, health and well-being of our patients. So back to data. So here's an example of just one ward's journey. This is the percentage of patients that were getting out in bed in, for time for lunch. At the baseline here on the left, it was about 12%. We started introducing active hospitals and some ward-based exercise groups last March, and this increased to around 40%. Along comes the Recon Games and a medal to reward continual engagement. And this is a bit of a motivator. It's a bit of a catalyst for change. So we jumped up here to 50%, which was the original target that we wanted on this acute ward. And then it's sitting at around 68% now, which is an enormous achievement. And just to stress here, this is a high acuity, very complex, um, very busy ward that th this has been achieved on. So what's going on with inpatient falls, you might ask? So this is one of the original balancing measures back when this started as a small QI project. And indeed, it was one of the main barriers to change, the fear of falling over. So active after Active Hospitals was launched back in mid-August, there's been a massive drop in falls, actually. And we're running at six points below the mean. So hopefully, fingers crossed for March, that we'll get that significant shift. And this is the falls rate per 1,000 bed days to account for fluctuating capacity. So since the addition of the Recon Games to the Active Hospitals plan, we've now got 16 wards, which is pretty much all of them, um, and they're all actively trying to get patients up in time for lunch. So here are a selection of pictures taken of some of the teams that have been awarded medals so far. And there's more to come as more wards have joined the programme. Uh, our lovely staff. So I think the collective effort on this scale is an, an enormous achievement. Um, and the feedback from the staff not only in terms of patient care, but their impact on their own day to day, their morale. It's been universally positive. And um, I think the eagle eyed amongst you might have noticed that as the medal certificates progress, there's a more diverse range of both registered and unregistered health professionals getting involved. So here we've got medics, we've got housekeepers, wall clerks and so on. So this is my last chart. So just to sum this up in terms of data collection. This is just a run chart that represents the total number of patients that we have evidence to show that are active out of bed in time for lunch. So starting at around 50-ish, we can now show that approximately 200 patients are being active every day. And overall, this equates to approximately 60% of patients over 16 acute wards. Um, coming back to our cardiology ward, they've achieved a high of around 96% of patients, an average just over 80% at any one time, which is an amazing example. I mean, obviously, all wards have different staffing, different demographics, different challenges. But on the acute cardiology ward, this isn't a rehab ward. This isn't a step down ward. It's a ward where patients are very unwell. So they're, they're doing incredible work down there. It's also important to note that these figures here are likely to be a massive underestimate, actually. Um, because it doesn't take into account patients where the ward hasn't managed to submit their data or the patients that are unable to sit out for medical reasons or acuity or whatever. It isn't perfect, there are gaps, some days are better than others, but what it does demonstrate is that now over 400 patients are possibly seen in a new light, 
Um, it's considered whether they're fit to sit out. What would the impact be if they didn't? What matters to Beverly? What does she want to do? Why is she in the bed? And this happens in some capacity or another across the organisation every single day. And this is what one of our lovely HCAs has to say. Hello, my name's Jenna. I'm a healthcare assistant from Ward B19. I think it is important for all staff to encourage our patients to remain active in hospital because it reduces risks of falling, it reduces risks of getting pressure ulcers, it reduces risks of becoming depressed, it can reduce anxiety and it can also promote a good sleep pattern. I think the active hospital programme has had a really positive impact not only on our patients promoting independence for them but also on our staff working together in many different roles as a team. I don't think I need to say much about that or this slide, as I think pictures speak a thousand words. You wouldn't have thought that these patients were blue lighted into hospital in varying degrees of crisis just days earlier. And the smiles are a real testament to the outstanding care given by our staff. And this is in such challenging times for both acute care and the NHS in general. So the feedback, like I said, from patients and their families, their morale has been universally positive. So as you can see from this roadmap overview, it's been a bit of a journey to get to this point. So the baseline planning and strategy development started at the end of 2021. And we're here now planning for our next steps and planning for sustainability. So moving forwards from the initial four approaches of getting the buy-in, getting the stories, developing a strategy and using data in a meaningful way. We're looking to the future to adopt active hospitals into everyday care. There are lots of ideas in the pipeline and we will go forwards through continual development of our workforce, through wider collaboration, through promotion, adopting this new culture and having the infrastructure to support us with delivery, which is key really. We'll shift the mindset from the majority of our acute patients from I am here to be sick to I'm here to recover and I'm here to start my own reconditioning journey. And by sustaining this culture, we will do so without ever needing to reach for the pajama drawer again, hopefully. So that's it from me. Thanks very much for listening. Um, and thanks to the Recon Games for giving me the opportunity to share our journey so far. Um, if you've got any comments or feedback for me outside of this, I've just popped a little QR code there and a link to a form. Um, it'd be great to hear from you. And that's it. Thanks very much. Thanks, Rachel. I mean, and just to thank you to you. I mean, we provide the space, but you you filled it beautifully with a with a presentation there that just really encapsulates what what this is all about, you know. And and well done, you know, everybody. Please, uh, you know, give that feedback to Rachel. It'd be really helpful, either in the chat now or using the QR code. Because I think, uh, yeah, lots of applause around the room. Fantastic stuff. Right, thank, thank you very much. Thank we'll come back to time. questions afterwards, and I'm sure there'll be loads of questions to ask you. And I've got I've got a few, but I'm going to kind of try and make this as seamless as possible, and just uh, hand over to Brian. So now that Brian's going to reflect a little bit more on what you've said already, um, so I'm going to the floor is yours, Brian. Thank you, and uh, that that was amazing. And and I spoke to Rachel on Monday, so I'm not going to do a slide uh, show more about. A, a soliloquy, if you will, and I, I spoke to Rachel and, and I was so blown away by the sort of things that she was describing. I thought, actually, rather than me going first, would it be OK if you went first? And then uh, if you like, in, uh, I could talk about your presentation and contextualise it and all of that sort of stuff. And, and as I was listening to what you had to say, I was struck by the words of Seamus Heaney, which is that the that hope is not optimism, but is rooted in the conviction that there's a goal worth working for. And, you know, looking at the comments of Jackie and Alison and and Jennifer and others, you know, it, it's striking. Obviously, it's, it's struck a core, but you've also succeeded in providing an evidence base of change, providing data, but also through the, the commentary around optimism bias. You've also brought to the party, what is it that is the constraint so often? 
And we are by nature as a species, we, we are more fear based than than success based. And some of that is to do with our survival as a species. I mean, we've only been notionally civilized for about 500 generations, but that's just a blink in the evolutionary eye. But we need, you know, we bad news is more sticky than good news in terms of our survival. And if you think about it, you know, a caveman or a cavewoman walked out um, out of their cave, and on the left they see a unicorn, and on the right there's a saber-toothed tiger. The ones who wandered over to the unicorn and said, "Oh, unicorn!" They didn't make it out of gene pool. They were quickly taken out. So we have a bias, if you will, towards anxiety and fear and the what ifs and the concerns. And unless we lean into the discomfort of what will happen if I make this change, we can't make progress. And, and sometimes I think I, um, we under communicate by a, a, by a factor of about 10. You know, I mean, how many of you in this room, for example, have ever had the experience, you know, if you have children of saying to your child, please don't do that again. And they go, OK, and it never, ever, ever happens again. Of course it does. You have to do it again and again and again. And, you know, when you're trying to reinforce messages, you have to keep repeating yourself. You have to keep going. And one day somebody said, oh, yeah, OK, because we under communicate. People may hear, but they don't always listen. But what it's also do about doing is having an evidence base while knowing that the evidence is never enough. And uh, <laughs> I did say to Rachel <laughs> when I talked about heads, hearts and hands on the phone, <laughs> I said, please remind me. So thank you for sliding that one in, because when it comes to change, it's three dimensional and the evidence isn't enough. The way we make culture change is through the hearts, the heads and the hands. The hearts is your why. The heart is we connect through story. As American um, poet Muriel Rokeyser said, the universe is not made of atoms, it's made of stories. And we connect through stories. We connect through the story of Beverly. We connect through the stories of our own families, of those we love going into hospital. One in six medical patients who go into hospital walking in will need a, a, an aid walking out. You know, we've said for decades, oh, go to hospital, you'll be safe there. And now we're going about that because we have started to realize instead of actually asking the question, is the patient you know, safe for discharge? A better question I think often is, is the patient safe for admission? And I do love, I've never been at all precious about NPJ paralysis as a title. He was born, in fact, in, the, in Broken Hill in the Australian outback. But if I thought it was going to get this big, I would probably have worked hard to come up with a better name. But, you know, it, it's what's important is, and, and you know, my my what I who I widely call my brother by another mother, the beautiful Ahmed, Dr. Ahmed Aurora, you know, him with the get up, get dressed, get moving. Um, in uh, Holland, they talk about bed centricity uh, in the States, particularly led by Johns Hopkins. They talk about everybody moves. Actually, I do really like active hospitals because on one level, it almost feels like an oxymoron. What do you mean you go to hospital to be active? That doesn't seem right. But actually what it's giving a message, as Rachel has alluded to, is you're not just going in to lay down, you're going in to recover. And mobilization is the critical bit. It's about preventing the unintended harms, the idiopathic harms that occur in hospitals. But the cherry on the top, of course, is getting dressed as well. And I think the sequencing of mobilization, then dressing is the right sequencing around it. So it's about the hearts, the connecting to the story, about the engaging the soul. The next bit is the heads bit, and this is where the data, for example, that Rachel has collected becomes so important. Having a strategy, having a this is the big picture, this is what we're trying to do, this is our timeline. So, and that's really quite important as well, because they are they are out, they are symbiotic and axiomatic. Without hearts, you can't have heads, and vice versa. But a bit that's so often overlooked is the hands bit. I believe in it. It's fantastic. I know why you're, what you're trying to do. What can I do? And too often we leave that bit out and it crumbles because people feel like I really wanted to help, but nobody can tell me all I can do. So enabling uh, the Jennas of the world, the healthcare assistants, and it's, and, and, you know, I love the fact that what you're doing is in, involving 
the HCAs in this mix, but also the junior doctors training and bedding in, in there. Amit and I a couple of months ago, and then so much thanks to, to Geraldine Rogers and, and Debbie on the, in the East of England, Babbitt and I did um, a talk for the East of England deanery. So dozens of junior doctors on that session, two hour session of lecture we gave. What was really striking in the feedback is we are not teaching our junior doctors this stuff. They're qualifying without an awareness of deconditioning. Um, I think it's striking to me that I did a talk for some, you know, undergrad physios and new grad physios a couple of years ago, and they too weren't familiar with it either. And, and, and nursing is the same. So we have a lot of work to do based on assumptions or biases we've had that people understand this. But actually, we've still work to do to enable people in getting our junior medical colleagues to understand this because there is a weight to what our medical colleagues say. That is just a reality. And when the doctors say, I think it would be really helpful for you to get out of bed, there's an added weight to that. Um, one of the things I'm proudest of is I'm the honorary president of Agile, the network of physios working with older people. Um, and the person has to do that role. And as I often say to physios, I love you, you scare me. You know, and I think the brilliant bit about physiotherapists is you're the kind of people who will say to patients, look, I know you don't want to get out of bed, but you need to get out of bed. It's very important to get out of bed. But I would also say this, since when did it become the physio's job to get patients out of bed? And what I am really struck by is I am 100% sure that where you are in Warrington and Halton, your staffing is as atrocious as it is everywhere, Rachel. And I'm sure absolutely in the east of England, an incredible work they did with the deconditioning games there in the east of England with 168 teams, which then became the platform for the national reconditioning games. Their staffing is atrocious. What it really tells us is this is a story of culture. When you see the 16 wars that have adopted and, and embraced this, this isn't about staffing. This is about shifts in culture. Because people, when they've got a great why, they will put up with any what. But the evidence isn't enough. We have to keep going because 70% of change efforts fail. 25% bobble along and recon games, MPJ, they sit in that space. Only 5% of change is fully successful, just 5%. And in part, that's because 80% of our time is spent planning, putting together Gantt charts, putting meetings together, and 20% is motivating, inspiring, supporting. And those percentages really need to be uh, turned around. And change doesn't really come top down and bottom up. Change actually comes side by side. One heart, one conversation, one mind at a time. It's when people are working alongside the HCA and explaining the why this is important to get them out. When you get the, the, the endorsements, because that is important to support by your chief nurse, chief allied, that gives an additional layer of permission. And, it, and something that leaders often underestimate is the importance of being directors of permission giving, supporting people, people feeling that if it all goes wrong, they've got my back. If that patient fell, that is OK, because it, if, if there's three dimensions about creating a safer culture. One is if I adjust culture, if I come to work and I do harm with malice, I am in trouble. If I come to work and I'm drunk or high on drugs, I am in trouble. If I do something reckless, I put a burr hole in the head of somebody with a headache, I am in trouble. But if I do something which causes, leads to harm and anyone else who says, there but for the grace, it means we have a system problem. And around, uh, from some work I've read, about 4% of all patients who develop a fractured neck and femur, 1.6 to 4% do so in a hospital setting. And so often they do so at about day seven, day eight, day nine. At the time, they've lost muscle mass. There's been demineralization of bone. They've lost sense of balance. They lost blood volume. So when they stand up, they get dizzy and fall. By the time some of them hit the floor, they've taken the head off the acetabulum. That is a system problem. And I think what's telling in your data is those who are mobilized on day one had very different outcomes. And that's the stuff we should be spreading all over the place because data, uh, what it does is this, it tells a story. 
many years ago I was at Oxford University and I was um, there on on Saturday night because we had a 20 the um, what they call gal day for the 20 the, those who matriculate from 1996 to 98 and while I was there I did a master's in educational research methodology and I was sitting down I was on junior dean for one of the years I was sitting beside one of the other junior deans and he said and he was an Aussie doing a doctorate in mathematics his, his PhD was only 56 pages we were sitting having lunch one day he said you know the thing with you and the thing with me you're doing largely qualitative work in research methodology mine is all hard science but one thing we do the same thing we ask of the data is this what story is it telling so when you look at run charts what you're doing is storytelling and we underestimate the power of storytelling through the visual metaphors which are run charts which another form of a run chart is a temperature chart because i think you know people can get over excited by driver diagrams and ishikawa diagrams and dry swim lanes but actually it's about connection to story and the power of the reconditioning still is at the power of the stories that it creates so um we have work to do but what we also are about is inspiring others people to step up to believe they can make a difference to know that their contribution matters and whether you touch the hands of patients or you touch the hands of those who touch the hands of patients you matter you make a difference and rachel when we spoke on monday i immediately said oh my goodness this is so incredible i would like you to speak at our linda holt and my global end pj paralysis summit which this year will be on the 12th and 13th of july from 8 a.m on the uh, 12th of july to 8 p.m on the 13th of july and we would like you to speak at it because look how much of a difference what and to give that to global and, and people like nick and the incredible ESIS team have been avid supporters over the many many years of all of that but it's about how do we amplify so someone in the middle of somewhere will be inspired to say i can do that too and never underestimate the power of one where one young then 15 year old sat outside her school on Fridays and said, you know, there is no point of going to school. And look at the impact Greta Thunberg's had. So let none of us underestimate the difference each of us as individuals make. And at 13.39, we promised we'd do about 20 minutes each. So let us open up the floor and thank you for your listening and your courtesy and your time. Thank you, Brian. Well, there's, there's an offer. Anybody got any questions for Rachel or Brian? You've got a captive audience right now. Have we locked your doors? Pop, pop, you, pop it in the chat or uh, hands up. I think, um, Jackie, I think you had a question if you're still with us for Rachel. I was going to ask the same question, to be fair. Jackie, you still with us? I am, yes. <laughs> Hello. Um, yeah, just I'm trying to sort of educate and engage nursing staff, particularly in the wards um, over here in terms of getting patients up and moving and preventing deconditioning and stuff like that. Um, but I'm not sure how much carryover it then has um, practically. So just a question around how have you managed to get such good engagement from everyone? Um, I think the pressures and the busy wards and stuff just means that people neglect to do um those bits even though they know that it's important um so yeah just to, just how have you managed to really engage people and um is it just a case of keep hammering that message home or um have you got any other tips i th i think it's possibly the opposite approach to to hammering i, I think uh the the way to to obtain um to get the buy-in to get the get that sort of collaborative approach is to ask um what do they want to learn what do they want to know to almost flip it upside down um, and to think about the bigger picture as well in terms of how can that training be embedded into what what they do every single day so rather than seeing as something additional so as something new to learn you have to look a bit wider into what existing knowledge is there where are the gaps and how can you support that learning from within rather than coming as an external sort of force in a way um 
So I think that there's a lot of work um, to be done with with teams within teams, uh, within lots of different teams. You know, it, there's no one set way to do it. It has to be feasible for the group that you work with. And I think you you cannot underestimate the sort of collaborative approach. And and, I, and like I said at the start, it's within the widest sense of the word. So think of your external support teams. Our clinical education department's been amazing, like I say, helping to adopt it within what's already there. So again, it's not an additional, it's something that's already existing, part and parceling it with falls and manual handling. So it's it's something that you can embed within what is already there. And like I say, you have to get the opinions from everybody what they what they feel they want, rather than just imposing on. You know, obviously we've got a lot. Everyone's in experts in their own right in 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 what what we know in in healthcare. But it's again having that collaboration um, between us as as to the best way forward. So I hope I hope that helps. Yeah, really helpful. Yeah, so it's a good way to look at it a little bit differently in terms of getting them to think about what it is they need to do and then educate from that point of view. So yeah, that's helpful. Thank you. Thank you. One of them may chip in is which is the uh, engaging with key influencers, and that is not a position. It's often more about connection. So you may identify a healthcare assistant who actually has real sway with others, um, but it's also about um. Questions don't mean resistance. Questions are often people are trying to process it. They're trying to get ahead around it. And subconsciously, people are always asking, am I safe? If I agree to this, will I be? what happens if it goes wrong? Will I be in trouble? What will happen to my team? What will happen to my patients? So addressing the fears, even if they haven't been articulated, is often a, a means to get people gently. And then the other thing is, we don't like to be sold, but we do like to buy. I'm drawing on the work of Simon Sinek here. You know, how many have ever gone into a clothes shop and then you're no sooner over the threshold? So can I help you? And you're thinking, ah, no, actually, I'll just walk out the door because you have just been harassed. So you sometimes can oversell it to a point. And there is, I'm trying to think if there's a, there is a, a, a known psychological theory on this, that if the more you push with stuff, the more people start to resist, which seems counterintuitive. But if people feel that keeping people safe in bears, it becomes their identity. So the more you're pushing back on that sense of, well, no, no, they'll be fine, they'll be safe. Actually, well, the more you're challenging their identity and the more entrenched that they can become. I, I give you exhibit A, Brexit. The evidence is not enough. So it's about gently bringing them from where, don't, and it's not starting where necessarily where you are, because that's a bit like going on holidays, yelling at people in English until they get it. Start with they are and work backwards. Which is what Rachel's been doing very clearly successfully. And I think the other thing to if I can build on that, Brian, as well, this is a message for sort of everybody really, and, and uh, anybody who's listening on, on the recording as well, is that not everybody gets it straight away. You know, I think that's what we hear, we hear a lot of is, and we, we we get comfortable doing what we want to do or we feel is the right thing to do and that omission bias that rachel was talking about before or overconfidence or there's all sorts of biases that we can we can talk about but people don't necessarily get it straight away the people in this room here today we're probably those early adopters we get it we know we, we know what the, why this is important because we're here but we have those other people who are curious but don't quite get it yet and then there'll be those who who are just not sure and are nervous. And then there's the downright skeptics. Listen to your skeptics. Listen. To, we often label those not a word I use. We often label those laggards. It's not a great word. They're skeptics. We haven't done enough at this stage to to give them the evidence, the data, the stories, whatever we want, to be able to allow them to feel comfortable with this idea. Some people will just get it and they will run with it and they'll be your allies. But give other people time. They will come on board if you if you can explain it properly. It just for some, we've had the privileged position of working this through ourselves in our own time, and we're here. We're here in this room today because we we believe in this this principle. We have to allow other people to go through that process as well. And for some, that can be minutes, hours, days, weeks, months, but it will come. It will come if if you explain it explain it well, well enough and give people the opportunity to to understand it. And I've, that was one of my deepest learning points that I found out years ago was, Nick, 
you know this already you know, whatever it is around improvement or change you've you've been through weeks of figuring this out why do you assume that the person in front of you is just going to get it in 30 seconds yeah. you know so it's 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 not that it's not that easy for some people uh lucy is there any other questions we picked up in the chat or anything else that we've no there were loads of comments um but no other questions in the chat and i think some really powerful messages both from brian mm. and rachel and some really helpful kind of practical hints and tips as well so really positive um feedback on the chat but no oh actually i changed my mind what one one question's come in from alison bone um so alison was asking rachel what was your biggest challenge um I think it was possibly starting and thinking this is such an enormous, enormous global thing. How on earth are we going to bring this together and do something and strategize it and get stories? How how, how on earth are we going to do that? I'm amazed to just carry on with what, what I'm normally doing. So I think it's it's having that that bravery to start somewhere and knowing that you're not going to have all the answers you're not going to have the journey mapped out in front of you if you need to do this you need to do that it, it's just having getting started i think is the biggest challenge and then again talking about coming back to what jackie was mentioning about getting that buy-in it's not being afraid of um the the resist not technically resistance but not being afraid of the barriers to begin with with trying to recognize what they are and plan for them and getting that collaborative approach so um some areas you know like 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 we've mentioned will be right on jumping onto it our you know our accu our cardiology ward were already involved in exercise to some extent so they they were bought in for some wards um, categorically said we do not have the staff we do not have the time to do this and they're one of our best sort of champions of this at the moment so I think that the, the biggest challenge is just starting and just having a bit of a plan and not being afraid of bumps along the way it, it's all part of the change. Mm, great advice Rachel this is always born out of a social social movement principle rather than a a project plan or an action plan. Mm. I mean, there's people that were very frustrated with me back in the summer when we started talking to me about what's my common strategy and what's my where's my plan. I haven't got one. You know, let's <laughs> let's let's figure it out as we go along. You know, we we have a we have a, a purpose. We have an a, we have an aim here. What we're trying to get to. And I'm going to throw back to Brian. He can explain it so much better than I can. Um, you talk about, I think it's uh, the ACE. Is yeah, it ACE? yeah, yeah, yeah. You, so this is Jeremy Hyman's and uh, his second name. So the book called New Power, written about four or five years ago. And so they talk to make, to enable a social movement to happen, it needs to be have three bits, actionable, connected and extensible, which is quite a clunky word. Actionable is, there will be an action taken. We want you to do a thing. So active hospitals end PJ paralysis, Black Lives Matter, you know, um, uh, uh, what's the one, F five things, which is about every time you go to a beach, pick up five bits of litter and we end up with clean safe. So it's actionable. Uh, the second thing is it's connected. So people, when people believe what you believe, they will follow you. And in many respects, that's the emotion bit of it is engaging people um you know your point Alison about it um you know feeling overwhelmed that's that's pretty normal I mean we all feel that you know just like imposter syndrome some of us wake up with it every single day but you have to keep leaning in and keep going keep going because bit by bit you 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 start to feel that it's making traction when um uh when it was uh, October to November 2016 I, I wrote the tweet that said nursing was born in the church and raised in the army um and putting people in pajamas is a uniform that turned into within days NPJ paralysis and there was um you know Tim Gillat colleagues of, of next Tim Gillat Pete Gordon from ESIST and Marie Riley who is now the director of nursing at UHNM and we were kind of chatting away, having quite good fun with building it very slowly. And then bit by bit by bit by bit, it, it became, well, what it was in terms of NPJ process, because the third bit is extensible. And the thing with extensible is people will, people will take what your idea and they will morph it into their idea on their terms. And a really important trick is you encourage them to do so. 
So I'll often say I may have created or be the originator of NPJ paralysis, but I don't own it. That way, everyone can own it and nobody needs permission. Because if you don't mind who gets the credit, things will be good in your life. So I celebrate the Rachels of the world and the Nick and the Geraldines and the and and the Amits and you know I can't tell you not none of our lights and none of our candles get dimmer when we hold them up for other people. So actionable, connected, extensible. And then you too can go and create a global social movement. Well, who knows? You know, you can try. Who knows? It's, the, it's the extensible one that we yeah, sometimes struggle thing. with. Is the we're trying to we're trying to control the 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 structure of it and allowing that freedom to just let it let it go. And yeah. there is a place for control and structure, uh, not if you're trying to create a social movement and trying to create a sense of um, you know interpretation of whatever whatever works. Because what 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 works in one area may not work work in in another. I don't think any more questions or anybody wants to pop their hands up in the last few minutes. If not, we well, we come will... and join us in heckle. <laughs> come into the yeah, conversation. We could chat and we'd probably talk about this all day to be fair. But it is one of those really important messages. I think we are getting starting to get to the point now where we're being a bit more bolder and brave about stating the patient harm message in this. And this was always the intent in what happens next after this, after the reconditioning games, where do we go next? Um, this was that this was the start. This was to get the conversation back going again. We felt there was an opportunity as we came out of the pandemic that to re-energize the message, but to be a bit more bolder in our statements and the and the and the data that you know Rachel was presenting earlier and Brian's talked about and we're seeing elsewhere. We're seeing this now, we're seeing a reduction in floor in falls, we're seeing a reduction in care package allocations in some areas. We've seen better cognition for patients. Another word that Jackie's doing in Birmingham, she's she's shown me some work as well that you know is, is making an impact down down there as well. You know, we are starting to see the difference. But it's not just about, isn't it lovely? Isn't it warm and fluffy? Isn't it isn't it isn't it just a bit of fun? Well, yeah, it's intended to be a bit of fun, but it's got a really, really important message that that sit behind. So I think the graph that you showed, Rachel, I thought was really helpful and interesting and, and I know that you made the point that you're probably under under reporting but the number of patients mm. that this is having an impact on having having seen that and I just did a quick while while we I was a quick quick check we've we've now awarded 600 medals across from 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 the start of the games in November across all the different colors and you, you know we can say well you know that's all lovely isn't it? it's all just about a medal and it's the drive, it's the motivation, as you've you've interpreted it, Rachel. You've inter you've created that incentive for people because we all like a bit of a bit of competition, a bit of motivation. But behind every one of those medals, that could be a, a a patient, it could be a whole ward, it could be a department, it could be you know, there's multiple patients that have benefited benefited as a result of that one single medal application. And for those of you on the call who want to go and see, although there is a whole database now full of all those medal applications, so all 600, you can filter it by various areas if you want, but you can see the exact details of what everybody's doing. The real simple ideas that Jackie was talking about before. We'll start small and see where it goes. You can find some of those really simple messages. So I encourage you to go and do that. Follow the uh, the good practice repository link that I put in the chat earlier that had Rachel's post on, and you'll see that. If you're just looking for inspiration, you'll find that. So 600 examples of that. Our next learning event is on the 6th of April. That's with our Chief Nursing Officer for NCS England, Charlotte McArdle. She's going to join us. So top, almost top of the shop in terms of nursing, uh, which would be great to hear from Charlotte, a great advocate for the work. And we're going to hear from Tracy and Joanna from James Padgett in the East of England and hear all the, about all the great work that they're, they're doing over in that side of the country. If you're around and you're on Twitter, we are holding a tweet chat this evening at 7 p.m. That's been hosted from the Recon Games UK uh, account. So come and join us for that. That will run for between seven and eight. There's a few questions that we'll post at regular points and just, just get involved. Uh, it's a way to sort of share what you're up to and, and, and listen to other people. But 
for now, I probably bombard you with lots of promotional stuff. Uh, please do join us if you can on the next uh, event. Uh, but for now, thank you so much to Rachel and Brian for your time today. It's been absolutely fascinating. And thank you, everybody else, everybody else, to for joining us today. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.